professional astronomer now, I started due to an amateur astronomy club in uh, Los Angeles. Used to be at Griffith Observatory, and um, same club as Jack Eastman. Despite that, I became an astronomer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and two interesting, uh, one interesting thing has changed apropos of the discussion you just had. It is really important to get younger people into astronomy. When I first became a professional astronomer 29 years ago, 1979, did I, 1980, did I do the math right? Yeah. Okay, the 15% of professional astronomers were women. In the entering class this fall of students studying to be professional astronomers, 40% yeah. are women. Yeah. That is quite a change. The other thing I was going to suggest is if you ever have a chance to work with school, I mean to visit schools, there's a project um, connected with the International Year of Astronomy. It's called the Galileo Scope Project. And I know a couple of people have been working on this really hard. The idea was to produce one million telescopes and sell them all for between ten and fifteen dollars each. Uh -huh. Okay? And I used the prototype about a month ago and I just about fell over at the quality of it for under fifteen dollars. Okay? I'm, I'm guessing from my use of it, it's approximately a 20 power telescope. It's in a plastic tube. It has an acrobatic lens. It has a two element eyepiece. It's considerably better than Galileo had. Okay, and the idea is that for ten dollars or fifteen dollars, whatever the exact price comes out, you can you can get a couple. And you know, if you wanted to leave them with an elementary school, that's something you know within most people's power to donate. It has a quarter twenty tripod thread on the bottom of it, and it's designed to be stuck on somebody's tripod. So I was just amazed. It makes you realize how much more profit margin those. Seventy dollar department store telescopes are <laughs> inferior to this Galileo scope. So if you want, I I ordered a hundred of them on behalf of the planetarium that I run up at C. Walter, and my plan is we're going to donate them as we send students out to work in the elementary and middle schools. So we'll maybe just leave one behind. So anyway, that's the old uh, the Galileo scope there. So I want to tell you uh, about a couple of things tonight. One is my favorite astronomical uh, trips, and explorations, adventures, and boondoggles. And they're about the two most dramatic things I've ever seen in the sky, the northern lights and eclipses. Uh, out of curiosity, how many people here have seen the total eclipse of the sun themselves? Wow, about half the people. And I predict that... How many of you have been surrounded by the northern lights? Yeah, you know, I mean, we saw them from Denver two years ago, and they were way off on the horizon, but I mean, just, you know, really where they were. Well, I was going to say, I remember 1957, we were surrounded by the aurora in Los Angeles, in the Palomar. I was only six. <laughs> <laughs> I was only three. <laughs> that, I, I'm sorry I missed that. <laughs> I understand that the Burbank Fire Department got more calls than they could count. We ran below. Well, the well, well, the Romans saw the Northern Lights in Rome. But uh, I'm not patient enough to wait half a century or so for the lights to come back. And so what I do is I take people up to the middle of the Canadian Arctic so that we can see the lights in a place where they come down almost every night. I started doing this in, uh, in the late 1980s. I was on the staff of the Hubble Space Telescope. And of course, Hubble got delayed in its launch about four years due to the explosion of the Challenger. And uh, it was supposed to be launched around solar minimum. And it was launched at solar maximum. And one of the effects of the eruptions on the sun that blow the solar wind particles through space and hit the Earth not only do they make beautiful northern lights, but they heat up the atmosphere a little bit and expand it slightly. And we were actually worried it would expand out to where Hubble was and make drag, and Hubble would re-enter prematurely. So I got stuck on some committee worrying about the solar maximum in Hubble. And as I was listening to some boring speaker, 
sitting in the back of the room, I thought to myself, <coughs> gee, I wonder if this big solar maximum is going to do, do anything good besides all this bad. And I thought, well, all my solar astronomy friends are going to like it, and it's going to be great northern lights. And then I got to wondering, why aren't there trips to northern lights? So I prevailed on them to do some spring and fall trips, and for over 20 years, every couple of years, I take people up, as I'll show you, to see the northern lights. Yeah, now we can go out to the dark for a while. So this is a satellite photograph. I hope you can see the uh, outline of the US superimposed. And this is what they call the auroral oval. And underneath that oval is where the maximum visibility of the aurora occurs, where you can see it, uh, you know, depending on the activity of the sun. But even at solar minimum, you'll see the aurora up there two-thirds to three-quarters of all the nights. So uh, that's where you want to go. Um, if you happen to be uh, in the space shuttle and you look out the window, you can take a picture like this and see the northern lights from above. Most of us don't get to do that. So I take people to two places. First place I took is to an Inuit or Eskimo village up on Baffin Island called Cape Dorset. And that was really very fascinating to see, you know, the Inuit are one of the few groups of native people that haven't been disturbed too much by the rest of us. You know, and that's because basically the land they live on up there on Baffin Island has no oil, has nothing that anybody wants to take, and, and so they've really been left pretty much alone for a long time. So it was fascinating to see the Inuit culture up there, but we actually were north of the auroral oval, so we only saw the northern lights about 40% of the nights, and, and that was disappointing. So nowadays, I take people to a place just outside of Yellowknife, which is labeled on the map. So uh, you know, you go from Denver and you fly to Edmonton, and then you fly about an hour and a half north on Air Canada up to Yellowknife. That's the Yellowknife baggage claim. <laughs> wow. um, Yellowknife is the heart of the whole eastern part of the Arctic. It has a population of about 20,000, and the entire rest of the Northwest and Yukon territories combined has a population of about 20,000. Last time I checked. So everything goes through Yellowknife. And uh, it was a minor <laughs> town. <laughs> it's uh, pretty proud of its heritage. You can take a tour of town, which takes about an hour. Um, you go past the little miner shacks. Ragged Ass Road is still there. And then what we do is we get on either a single otter or a twin otter, and we fly 100 miles past where all the roads end. And we go to an absolutely wonderful lodge called Blatchford Lodge, mm -hmm. sitting on this edge of this lake. Um, it's sort of the life's work of this Canadian couple that always wanted to run their own bed and breakfast or hotel. And uh, they bought the property about 20 years ago. And it had some small cabins on it, and then they built this wonderful lodge. Um, you'd think that, and you can tell all your friends that you've been up in the Arctic, if you go on one of these trips, you know, we go there for about a week, and you say, I spent a week in the Arctic, and they think that you're starving and everything, but in fact, um, there is a five-star chef named Danny who worked at some famous Canadian restaurant but really doesn't like the city, so he's the chef in residence up here at Blackford Lodge, and usually somebody on the trip catches some nice big fish, and Danny serves it that night. Um, this is one of the staff making like a moose. Um, remember, there's no road within 100 miles. It's the quietest place I've ever been. Any noise you hear, you've made it. There are not even any planes that fly over. It's not on any routes. So it's really quite amazing. If we go in the fall, it looks like this. If we go in the spring, they have a hot tub. It's about 20 feet from the front door. So you make this wonderful dash through minus 10 degree temperature and <laughs> dive in the hot tub and get icicles on your head. <laughs> um, in the winter time, this lake is, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say the winter time. Nobody goes there in the winter because it's too cold. Okay? Summertime, you don't want to go because there's no northern lights. It's always light. So the two seasons are spring and fall. Um, the picture below was taken in the fall when the lake is all clear of ice. In the spring, the lake is still frozen. 
The lodge has its own dog sled team. So when you're up there in the springtime, you can go around with sled dogs. Is it April you go? Pardon me? Is it April? Uh, usually the end of March. Yeah. yeah, right about then. So it's very, very pristine and beautiful. The, uh, the eagle there, that is actually the front of the lodge. That tree is about 30 meters from the door of the lodge. So it's very beautiful and very, very unspoiled country. And of course, the great thing is, is that virtually every night, the, the lights spring into action, and you see beautiful, beautiful northern lights. You can actually see them reflected a little bit in the lake there, and you can see the Pleiades rising. And this is basically just taking a Canon digital camera, putting it on a tripod, and 20 second exposure. And you just, you know, 10 <coughs> seconds, 20, or 30 seconds, and this is what it looks like. Just beautifully, as some of you know, dancing across the skies there. What's the temperature? So, uh, it's quite a big difference between the spring and the fall trips. <coughs> I would say, well, let me tell you the spring trips first. The spring trips are the ones to boast about. Um, a typical <coughs> end of March day there is like a typical January day here, or maybe in Breckenridge. So a typical daytime <coughs> temperature would be about 5 above, maybe 10. And the typical nighttime temperature would be about 0, maybe 5 below, more like 0. Then in the, in the fall, it's all 40, 50 degrees warmer. So the daytimes are 60 degrees, and the nighttimes are 35. It's like a heat wave by comparison to the spring. The trouble is that in the spring, you get to do all the things you can boast to your friends about. You went with the sled dogs, you built an igloo, um, the staff there know how to build an igloo and you can sleep in it, and uh, that's sort of a fun thing to do. Yeah. Um, in the fall, you can hike around and you can fish. But even in the spring trips, um, they always dig a hole and do ice fishing. And I've never been on a trip where, I'm not a fisherman myself, but Every trip, somebody's caught something really big and good, and then Danny keeps it. So that's pretty nice. In the fall, you get carried off by mosquitoes. No, actually, it's cold enough yeah. that uh, there's not mosquitoes there. Is it September or October? Uh, usually September. Yeah. So uh, one of the people on my last trip is an amateur semi-pro photographer. And he took several of these really nice pictures. Um, I took this on a previous trip, and I didn't quite realize when I first started going there how rare the red aurora is. Two of my trips, we had red aurora nights. And the wife of the owner of this lodge is actually a professional photographer, and she's never photographed the red aurora. I just figured it was common, so the first time I photographed it, I didn't even wipe her out. It, it took a year to apologize for that. <laughs> so like the little legend I put there, I don't know if you've ever thought of it this way, but if anybody asks you, you know, what causes the aurora, the stuff that's coming to us from the sun is basically hydrogen, which consists of a proton and an electron. But the solar wind is hot enough that those atoms split apart, we say they're ionized, and it's basically a stream of protons and a stream of electrons. Well, that's what's inside your fluorescent light. You know, it's a stream of electrons going from one side of that long tube through the gas to the other. And when the electrons hit the atoms in the tube, they excite them and they give off light. So being in the aurora is really like being inside a giant fluorescent light. Um, I got very lucky with this picture. So, one of the uh, staff at Blatchford Lodge, Danny, is uh, a Dene Indian. When you think about the people who inhabit the far north, probably a lot of people think of Eskimos. And usually you're thinking of the Inuit people. They live in the north, but they live to the east. Okay, And in the eastern Arctic, um, there's very few tall trees. It's basically open, you know, like tundra. The people who drive sled dogs in the eastern Arctic, they hitch them in a fan shape. 
So you'll have eight dogs that will all be fanning out. In the western Arctic, you're still in the forest, as you can see. The native people are the Dene people. When they hitch up sled dogs, they hitch them two, 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 and two. And so you can go in between the trees. So Danny, who's a resident uh, Dene, built this rather large, beautiful teepee. It's about 15 feet high. And uh, he had a fire inside, and he was teaching us some of the native crafts, teaching us how to dry fish and salt them and put them away for the winter. I mean, I didn't do that, but I learned how to do that, because <laughs> Danny was cooking back at the lodge, right? Uh, anyway, you can see there's the belt of Orion right there. And uh, I just, again, I took, this This was actually several years ago before I had a digital camera. So this is just a slide film. And um, there's Orion's belt, and the Orion Nebula, and uh, the TP. And I kept this on my website, and much to my amazement, three years ago I got contacted by National Geographic, and they said, we saw your picture, would you sell? And I thought to myself, sure, I'd, I'd give it to you. They were nice enough to buy it and publish it. So now I'm very tired that I can say I publish it. The thing that's impressive about this picture, not only the very weird shape of the aurora, it's not too unusual, it's called you know a curtain shape. It looked like, uh, it was very regular. It went a long ways across the sky, almost like the teeth of a saw. you know. Uh, but the impressive thing is this picture was taken from bed. Okay, this is in bed in the lodge, and that frame is the window. Okay, it made our own curtain perfectly. Yeah, that's right. And I'm sort of proud of this one. That is actually Venus and a reflection of Venus in the lake, and a little teeny bit of aurora disappearing at dawn. So, this is really quite a, a delightful place to like disappear from everyone else. Once you're there, once the Twin Otter leaves, you're on your own for a week. You know there's no telephone, um, there is an emergency satellite phone, and that's it. So that's an unusual thing in this day and age. Uh, these happen to be just a couple of pictures from over in the Eastern Arctic. So in fact, this is what Cape Dorset looks like. This actually isn't Cape Dorset, this is Thule. Greenland, another place that we've stopped. Um, if Cape Dorset sounds at all familiar to you, it's a place of uh, very famous artists, and there are um, carvers and printmakers, some of the finest in Canada, live in Cape Dorset. And it's fairly amazing to realize the population of the entire village is 600. And out of the 600 people there, are probably 200 are professional artists. Isn't that an amazing sort of percentage? And those are some of the Dorset prints. I really find them wonderful. You know, they have, um, traditionally people up there live very close to the land. And they're with the animals all the time. They hunt the animals, they eat the animals, or fish, but they respect the animals a lot. <laughs> and, and it's pretty common to say, oh, this man is a bear. And they and they mean that more than we do. You know, they'll make they'll make art and half the body will look like a bear and half will look like a man. And they're saying very specific things. So so you know, here's sort of a combination uh, man and something. Oh, okay. It's a Portuguese yeah. yeah. Now, I like this one because, like I said, we did build an igloo, and I slept a few nights in the igloo. Um, it's not any warmer in an igloo than it is outside, but there's no wind. And, you know, if you're out in the wilderness here, you know that the wind is what really gets you cold when, it, when the temperatures are cold. And so much better than any tent that I've winter camped in, um, the igloo stopped all the wind. The other thing is, is that Eskimos would all sleep under one set of furs and all together and keep each other warm, historically. So, um, while I was there, because I'm sort of a ham, that's why I was a national public radio science guy for four years on WPZ Chicago, 
Um, I like talking about science, and so they never get any tourists, except for us, into this village. And so I decided to go to the Katie Dorset School, and you can see there's a lot of kids there, and I was all ready to tell them about the wonders of astronomy, which I did, but one of the, you know, when you give a talk, you always want to find out what people have already learned. Like, it's important to me to know that half of you have seen eclipses already. So I wanted to ask the kids a few questions, and one of the teachers whispered to me, ask them if they've seen a tree. So I asked all these kids if they'd seen a tree, and three of them had. All the rest have never seen a tree in person in their lives. Of course, they see walrus, polar bear, all these kinds of things all the time, which I doubt too many kids in schools here have seen. Well, apart from chasing the northern lights, I chased eclipses. Um, the first eclipse that I chased was March 7, 1970. It's funny how those dates stick with you. I was a freshman at Caltech at the time, and I knew there was an eclipse in Mexico, sort of farther Mexico near Oaxaca, but it was the closest one you know, for a while, and so I asked for permission to go to the eclipse, and amazingly I was granted two weeks leave from school, and so we crammed into a little VW bug, two friends and I, uh, Art Johnson, oh, wow. Craig Halverson, yeah. we drove for a week, we saw the eclipse, we went into a little teeny village in the mountains of Mexico, I would guarantee you we were the first tourists ever to set foot there. We introduced the concept of frisbee. All the people <laughs> <in there. laughs> and we saw the eclipse and came back. And uh, so I've been chasing various eclipses uh, since then. And since I found somewhere in my career that I really like explaining astronomy and had all this practice on the radio, I got to know a lot of really good speakers. And so more recently, I've tried to put the trips together and invite four or five or six speakers from all over the U.S. that are people that I know will make the trip very interesting when the eclipse isn't happening. And then there's, of course, the eclipse. So in 2006, I know some of you in this room even came with me, I took over 400 people to see that eclipse. I managed, I didn't really plan to do such a big thing, but it just kept snowballing and we finally more or less took over a cruise ship. And, um, got our chance to see an almost completely clear sky and, and clear eclipse. Um, I lived in Italy and did some research in, in Florence, Italy for a while, right near where Galileo used to live. And so I know something about how Italians behave. And I knew that the chance of seeing any eclipse on a cruise ship goes up in proportion to how much the captain wants to see the eclipse. So the first day I was there, I brought two nice bottles of California Cabernet, had lunch with the captain, gave him both, and he's a complete eclipse devotee now. <laughs> so that's the ship's crew. And those are actually a couple of astronomy professors from CU who were speakers on it. Um, I thought this was pretty inventive. You know, you can make a pinhole camera with any kind of pinhole. And this woman discovered that the key to her door, which had all these little holes punched in it, was, was making 20 crescent suns to see the partial phases of the eclipse. Uh, excuse me, what ship was it? The Costa Classica. So it's an Italian ship that we took in 2006. Uh, so I always like using binoculars to project images of the sun during the partial phases. And then, of course, you come to the total phase of the eclipse, which, if you've seen it, you know it's, a, it's just a stunning sight. To me, it feels like the end of the world. Okay, and to my eye, there are colors that you see during a total eclipse that you never see any other time. I think that's because normally the illumination of the Earth is coming from the body of the sun, but during the few moments of totality, it's coming from the corona, which is a definite silvery cast, and it's really very different than anything else you'd ever see. And then, uh, as the eclipse goes on, you can sometimes see prominences at the edge of the sun. Um, but it's impossible to capture in a picture, right? No picture, even a video, does justice to what it's like to really see a total eclipse. However, I found that the audio 
that goes with the video is pretty uh, true to life. In fact, it captures the spirit of, of an eclipse so well that when I play the audio back, most people deny that it was them. So <laughs> 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 uh, So I actually uh, have a little bit of video and some audio from this class. So that's what you do afterwards. And when we get close to totality, yeah, that's the camping trip. Now I'll let it run. So where's the sound to this? I don't know. I've been looking over here too. Oh, that's that's uh that's our driver. Are you sure he's not got <laughs> Every direction. 